influence, right, what people think of you. Uh, but uh, it's not so easy, and the larger the company, the, the harder it gets. And the reason for that is because there's, uh, there's a lot of factors that go into uh, the reputation that you earn amongst your stakeholders, the clients and employees and that sort of thing, right? So what we have to do is we have to take into consideration not only those influences and what's influencing how people view your, your particular company, um, but also you actually have to determine that you're going to pay attention to your corporate reputation. And, you know, a lot of folks are, are more of the mind that as long as you just go about your daily business and you do a good job and you meet, uh, meet the promises that you've made and provide the services or technology or solutions that you promised uh, to take care of, then, you know, reputation just sort of follows along with that, right? Uh, but then there's the big giant unless. And we'll talk a little bit about that here in just a moment. So uh, certainly reputation is built by character, and uh, that's formed by right, integrity and fair play. So you treat your employees fairly, you treat your customers fairly, uh, you treat the environment with care, uh, and you're, you know, you're a good citizen in the community where you work. Uh, all of those things uh, make a big difference. Uh, but, but the thing is, is that what, what's fair varies by who you ask, right? So we kind of can talk about, you know, what you ask a Democrat what's fair, and you ask a Republican what's fair, and, you know, you probably will find some common ground and, and some uh, diversity of opinion. And the same thing is true uh, of companies because you know, companies have, uh, depending on the size, you know, you may have investors, and you know, your investors, if you, uh, if you have stock, if you're traded on uh, one of the, of the New York Stock Exchange, or even if you have private investors, uh, you know, whoever it is that helped your company get started or helps it continue to raise capital or investment, that sort of thing, these folks have some very specific concerns uh, about what's going on with their company. So they're looking, of course, at return on investment. They want to make sure that you're not making highly risky decisions or there's not a lot of highly risky behavior going on, right? Because that's their investment and they want to make sure and protect that investment and they want to make sure that you're making good use of their trust in your company relative to the funds that they've committed to your, to your firm. Uh, they're also very concerned about the leadership of the company. Uh, certainly a company can have a bad quarter, for example, and you know, your investors usually won't just all bail out on you. As long as you have a leader that can uh, convey vision for the future, and the vision makes sense with the marketing, you know, the market conditions and the skills and capabilities of the business, that kind of thing, right? So investors have, uh, you know, when they're thinking about who to decide to invest in, because they have lots of choices, for them, the reputation of the company is, is really along the lines of leadership, your ability to manage and minimize risk, and uh, either your ability to uh, get a return on investment or the potential. You know, there you have the potential for getting to a place where you're going to get a return on your investment. Um, employees, right? We're all employees of a company as well. And so as employees, uh, most folks want to feel like they're working for a company that isn't, you know, out there doing bad things. Uh, you know, a company that's behaving in a legal and ethical way. You want to feel proud of the company that you're associated with. You also want to make sure that, you know, you're hoping that your company is stable. So that sort of speaks back to risk. So there's some common ground there, right, between investors and employees. They want to make sure that the company is going to be around for the foreseeable future. And, and hopefully, too, as well, that they can, you know, that there's some growth potential, that they're going to be treated fairly. They're going to have opportunities for advancement and, and that sort of thing. So they're focused on that kind of thing. And of course, depending on their personal views, they also may be very focused on, for example, how green the company um, and also, you, you know, you start thinking about your customers. Um, 
you know, your customers, your clients want to make sure that you are doing what you said you would do. They want a good product or service. They want to feel like they're probably getting even just a little bit more than they expected rather than a little bit less than they expected. They want you to have competitive pricing. And, you know, I think everybody in the room can agree they want to have good customer service. You know, we've all made those phone calls, uh, Travelocity or whoever you're trying to get through to, right? Uh, and, and it can be so frustrating. So, uh, so again, you know, you see some common ground between stakeholder groups, but how they view the company and, and how they would rate your reputation, your reputation in their mind, is really associated with their particular views and interests. So those are the kinds of things that companies have to contend with. And uh, certainly, you know, it's, it's not all that easy um, to make everybody happy. And, and when I say happy, I mean, certainly, you know, there's sort of range of happiness even, right? Uh, but you <coughs> certainly need to make sure that you understand uh, how different groups, audiences, look at your company, judge your company, view their interactions with your company, and uh, you know the statistics are showing, depending again on how you know what kinds of um, solutions or products that you might have. So particularly if you're interacting with a sort of consumer public, so a B2C company, lots of uh, lots of people are more and more very interested in you know what are your policies around things like uh, fair trade. You know what are you thinking in terms of what are you doing now in terms of helping. Uh, with green initiatives. They, they care about social responsibility um, and they're paying attention to that. Now, not to say that we're all out there doing a lot of research on every company, but you know, we, we get lots of help, right, from the media and, and from other sources. So one of the things that the companies have to be sure that they're doing is communicating with their stakeholder audiences. When I say communicating, I don't mean just outbound. You know, you, don't, you shouldn't be doing all the talking. You should be asking, you should be looking for ways to interact with your audiences, whether it's through surveys or blogging, social media avenues is a great way uh, for a lot of companies to, to get some feedback from their um, constituents, if you will. Uh, you know, talking to your clients and asking, not just talking about the project that you're working on, but asking them, how are we doing in your mind? What can we be doing better? What's your perception of our company? Um, and so that communication is very, very important in order for you to even understand what's going on in terms of how you're viewed. Uh, transparency certainly kind of a big, a big uh, theme or idea that uh, we see more and more of these days. And what does that mean? transparency. Well, for the most part, it means that what you do and how you do it is uh, pretty easy to understand, uh, that your company is uh, accessible, that people can either go to your website, see the information they need, they can understand how you operate, understand things like your mission, your vision, your values, those sorts of things, and also uh, the way that you operate in terms of things that are important to you. Uh, you know, are they using you know, sweatshops in uh, Bangladesh for production? Does that matter to you? Can you get at that information uh, pretty readily? So transparency is, is super important. And of course, in today's, um, in today's world, the bigger the corporation, it's almost like the more transparent you better be because there's sort of a, a you know, a, uh, I think a healthy uh, distrust in some ways of big corporations and uh, some of that they run on themselves and of course certain companies do a great job at being transparent and communicating. Uh, but that's certainly a, an area that's very important to folks. Um, and training uh, within the company, your own company. So it's one thing to say that reputation matters to our firm. We're going to be intentional around uh, making sure that our reputation is what we want it to be. We're going to align our culture uh, and uh, train our people in such a way that where we're headed or, or what we uh, aspire to from a reputation standpoint actually is, is, uh, is going to happen. It's actionable uh, because, you know, I, I uh, work with plenty of companies that have a mission and a vision and, you know, they have their goals and their strategies and everything, but um, 
but then really they don't communicate a lot of that across their employee organization, and so there's a disconnect between what they intend to do and what actually is gonna happen um, in the days and months and years ahead, right? Um, and also measuring. Certainly it's, uh, it's important to measure what you do, and uh, that's easy to get done, either just you know, by starting with a baseline survey or you know, the communication that we talked about just a moment ago. That's right, we share. <laughs> all right, so um, uh, since you guys are not all of you are eating, I'd like to sort of ask you a couple of questions because I'm curious and like to know what you think. Uh, what are some companies that, from your perspective, have a good reputation, a good corporate reputation? Menlo. Men Sorry? Menlo in Ann Arbor. Menlo. Why? Um, they communicate openly. Their CEO goes out um, often and communicates how the company works internally. And it's a very ethical way and a very supportive way that they support their employees. So they're good communicators. So you're aware that, and, and you agree with and admire the way they handle their operation and deal with All right? Who else? Apple. Apple. I knew that one would come up. Tell me why you think so. Uh, just the line of products they have and the way they go to market is uh, they, they perceived, they're perceived to be ethical and their products are high tech and uh, changing their life. So they, they, they really have done a good job, uh, I think, in terms of the way they project and present their company. Uh, and I think even even when uh, you know you might hear some rumblings. I think I heard something not all that long ago about the, you know the way some you know production item being done offshore somewhere. And uh, but the thing about Apple and other companies that have a good reputation is they have what I call bounce back. So if there's some issue, you know it's dealt with and they move on. And uh, you know Steve Jobs was a, a master at that, right? And and very straightforward. It fully punches. Who else? I see. I see a lot of CEOs, of companies now building their headquarters in downtown, like Zappos. I read an article about them in Las, right downtown Las Vegas, where it was really seedy. And you know, Dan Gilbert and you know, Compuware moving into the Detroit area. Right. So that says a lot about <coughs> a lot of different things. But it's, overall, it's going to be very profitable for them too. It's very yeah, I, I, you know, I just read something uh, just today about uh, how Detroit and housing prices and that sort of thing are starting to, you know, maybe not bounce back exactly, you know, but they're starting to recover. I think that's a really good point. You know, there are companies out there that are making a, a strong community stand, a commitment to specific communities that need help, that can benefit from their presence, and uh, certainly uh, going into downtowns, as you say, that might need some revitalization, and helping be an anchor for that, and investing in the community. That says a lot about those companies, and certainly means a ton to the communities where, you know, where they've invested. Sure. Any others that come to mind? Yeah. I'm in Detroit and Arbor area, uh, Hillary's Market. Sure. And, and tell me why you feel that way about them. Um, I mean, just it's a nice local, you know, the family runs the grocery store, the meat, and the uh, produce selection is always so nice, and it's commercials, just real down to earth, and right. it sounds like when you, when you talk about it, it's like, wow, he really, you know, likes it, and it makes you want to go in. And sure. Find the title. So in that case, you might say that you, you have, you know, they can sort of seem like us, right? They're not some sort of big corporate conglomerate, you know, they're people that could be your neighbors. Uh, you know, somebody that you can relate to and uh, seem to have good work ethic, for example. So they're conveying a, 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 not only a message about who they are as owners, but also their commitment along the same lines around just wholesome foods and that kind of thing, right? You walk in and it's brand consistency with what you're seeing in promotions and otherwise. Any others? Probably yeah. one more before. <laughs>
to plenty of folks, you know, there's a lot of opinions about sort of the whole bailout thing, and Ford's one of those companies that managed to, you know, get through the dark days and get on the other side of it without a bailout, and for those people that, uh, you know, they didn't get a bailout themselves, right? So they had to work hard, they had to work through some of these tough economic times, so there's an affinity for that, there's some admiration for the way that they, they went about things, so yeah. And, you know, I'm going to say, American-made cars, they're looking pretty good these days, right? The Mustangs and the Camaros, that's, you know, I'm all about that stuff. <laughs> all right, so let's move on then. Uh, you guys have made all, uh, you know, some very good points. And uh, I think that one of the things that I'm listening for and I'm hearing from you, and, and I think that you picked up on this as well, is that how you feel about a company really is a feeling. So it is an emotional connection that you have or you don't have uh, with the company. And certainly, just like any relationship that you might have, that emotion that you feel for a company is based upon you know, all of the things we've been talking about, whether it's personal experience, which is the highest predictor of uh, your perception of reputation, but also what you see in the media, what you hear from trusted colleagues, friends, that kind of thing. So a lot of input factors there. Well, um, certainly, uh, you know, companies uh, with great reputations, right, uh, can uh, fall very, very, very quickly from craze. Uh, I was uh, with a B2B company, one of our clients, not long ago, and they were, they, uh, were indicted uh, by an attorney general in Nevada. And, uh, uh, they, they had been in communications with the Attorney General and they've been asking questions and they've been answering that sort of thing and, and, uh, and they were under the impression that there was a working relationship there and all of a sudden it hit the newspaper and in 20 minutes their stock dropped 15% uh, just from that hitting the news. So, uh, you know, these are the kinds of things that can happen. They can happen very suddenly. Uh, they can very often be unearned. Sometimes they're earned, right? Uh, you know, some of these companies they do some some things that you know you got to roll your eyes out, uh, roll, roll your eyes, and you know you think about some of the um, things that people say. Some of the senior leaders. If I say to you, I just want my life back. You know what company? The CEO said that. Who was it? <laughs> Yes, I mean, there, there are things like that. You're like, really? You know, there's a lot of other things going on here, right? So, uh, yeah, I mean, so companies can uh, can be uh, at, the, at the height of their, um, you know, at the height of their uh, uh, reputational curve, if you will, and have a ton of reputational equity, and uh, all of a sudden, you know, it can be gone. And, you know, social media is a big part of that, right? Uh, uh, and we are more and more seeing the power of social media. We're seeing the power of how people influence brands. They influence what happens with companies, which is pretty amazing, right? You know, for, for forever, you didn't feel like you could really make a difference uh, in terms of what a corporation might be doing or not doing. And uh, those days are over, right? They're, they're making influence on uh, what's happening in countries around the world. So social media, a very big deal. and. Uh, and again, it can be earned or, or certainly unearned. So for example, I don't know if any of you guys uh, remember Domino's Pizza, you know, uh, Ann Arbor firm, right? Do you remember their little snack do with some, uh, some of their employees out on YouTube? Well, it was the um, racing to make the 30 minute delivery time. Oh, yeah. I mean, yeah. One of those. Yeah, that's true. There were accidents too. Yes, that's right. That's a little bit farther back than I was sort of thinking about. But you, yes, you remembered that, and that's a very good point. You know, really, in, in uh, the whole thirty-minute uh, delivery time, and, and what are you putting at stake uh, when you rush to get those pieces delivered? <clears throat> Uh, the one that happened all, uh, maybe last year or the year before is where uh, some of the employees, you know, kids somewhere, you know, thought it would be funny to, you know, do some really gross things as they're making a pizza and film it, right? I don't know what all they did. I never watched it, but it sounded like it was gross and, you know, really unappealing. And then they put it in a box and the kids thought they were going to go off and deliver it. And they put it out on YouTube. And... Well, dumb, yes, but, uh, you know, the Domino's stock took a, you know, a tank right out. Uh, everybody was nervous about eating Domino's pizza. You know, 
know, nobody is, oh my gosh, how widespread is this kind of behavior, right? And of course, it was just a couple of kids thinking something was funny. Um, and in that particular case, uh, you know, the, um, the uh, leader there at Domino's did, you know, did a great job getting right on top of it. And, you know, we don't tolerate this kind of, you know, tracking down who the guys were. I think there was a kind of girl involved and, um, you know, making sure they were out of there. So, uh, but, you know, nonetheless, you know, they took a big hit to their reputation and really you could say they didn't do anything wrong. Obviously, just hired the wrong people in that particular case. It begins with, uh, with bad judgment. What about um, our food line in the Mediterranean? Oh my gosh. I was going to use that as an example. I'm like, I just can't go there. That's just so, so tragic, right? So I was trying to go to the that's just shocking to me. You know, that is just shocking to me because, well, although we say, right, if there's an airplane crash, air travel is really super safe right after that. So I mean, maybe that's it. And, and uh, people have been, you know, had plenty of uh, successful experiences on cruise lines. You know. it, it impacted me personally. I'm not getting like that. So this is me, right? Um, but, you know, certainly um, individuals, in the case of dominoes, right, a couple of people had a huge, a huge impact on, uh, on that corporation. And also small groups can have a real disproportionate impact on companies. So you have, you can have, you know, a couple of people who, um, you know, make some claims out on social media or have a, an issue, you know, let's just say they're in you know, more of an activist role. They have something they want to make sure that that company does, or they want to change, or that kind of thing. And they get uh, a couple of people together, and all of a sudden you've got giant corporations that are reconsidering policy uh, just because they're, you know, the, the small, uh, a small group of people can be really noisy and be heard, heard all the way around the world. So, you know, there's, you know, people have to think about that really. Is that, is that okay with us? You know, if we're the majority and we like things the way they are, there's a small group that's having a big impact on a company's public reputation. You know, how do companies maneuver through that? It's, it's a difficult situation for them. Um, and so, you know, of course, the media, you know, they're already always willing to jump on any controversial or bad news, right? And lots of people are uh, are reading all that stuff, right? So we're the consumer of that, and uh, we get bored. So I guess, you know, we like to uh, like to look at that sort of thing. But I wanted to just touch on really briefly here, um, you know, just a couple of the companies that you've probably heard of. We've already talked about Domino's and. Uh, you know, Netflix, right? You guys remember what happened there? They decided to suddenly raise their price. And Netflix, right? It's, the, it's Netflix. It's the you know, cheap and easy uh, provider of uh, video content, that kind of thing. And uh, not only did they decide to you know, raise their price, but they decided to split their company into Netflix and Clickster. And, uh, you know, I thought that it was. Uh, interesting to me that not only did they destroy their reputation, but they still have not recovered from that. And uh, I just was looking at this quote that I saw uh, from, you know, they got their 2011 earnings and um, the CEO of uh, Netflix in a recent SEC filing said, if we're unable to repair the damage to our brand and reverse negative subscriber growth, our business results of operations, including cash flows and financial condition, will continue to be adversely affected. And so really, you know, that whole snafu right there could literally destroy that company. It may never recover. So, uh, you know, uh, and we look at, at uh, other companies like Bank of America, Really, you know, five bucks to use your debit card? They just thought that that was just going to, you know, go right through. And again, you know, through the, the power of social media and through the power of people, uh, they had to, uh, you know, make a, make a reversal on that decision. And of course, we talked briefly about BP. Susan B. Coleman, what a tragedy there. You know, uh, an organization that's had, you know, such a tremendously good reputation and done a lot of good for, um, for many, many people are, you know, find themselves in the middle of a controversy because they didn't think through policy in the context of their stakeholders, right? They either somehow or another, they just uh, missed the sentiment and the, the concerns and the, the reactions of their core target audience, which, 
you know, I guess uh, you know companies do that kind of thing all the time and make the poor decisions, but they've got a lot of work here to do to try and uh, recover that reputation. So we'll see how they do. Um, all right, so uh, handling a crisis certainly is, uh, you know, something you don't want to have to do, but if you have to, you want to be ready for it. So uh, regardless of the size of the company, it's super important to have a crisis communication plan in place. And by that, you just brainstorm everything that could possibly go wrong. Your CEO is arrested for drunk driving, you know, whatever happened. You know, just any kind of uh, circumstance that could happen. You know, you decide who's uh, okay to talk to the media, who's authorized, right? Who's been trained? What are the key messages of the company that are the overarching messages? And then how are you going to contend with specific issues? And this is really important because during a crisis, I gotta tell you, I've uh, worked with companies that nobody else would tell you about, right? Who uh, had that 15% uh, drop in share pricing in uh, 11 minutes. And uh, if you don't have a crisis communication plan, what we see is you know, sort of that deer in the headlights. Thing. Uh, first of all, they don't do enough communication because people wanna know what's going on. They're afraid to communicate, and then internally they sort of fight over whether or not they should communicate. And then they fight over every word of everything they should communicate about. And then it's not executed well, and uh, it really just makes matters worse. So it starts out bad, and it goes worse from there. Um, and so you know, you want to be able to be transparent. You want to be able to communicate the facts. People are listening. They're making a decision about your honesty and your integrity, and whether or not you're acting um, uh, in alignment with what you said or your values or mission, that sort of thing. Um, but let's just say that there's an issue up there and you've got some sort of legal implication. You really can't talk about everything. You know, uh, certainly you shouldn't talk about things if you don't know the facts. You should never say, well, I think this or that. You need to say, you know, let me chat, right? And if you can't talk about some area of the issue, the most important thing to do is let people know what you can't talk about. Don't just leave it as something that's unsaid. I can't talk about this area because there may be some legal implications as information becomes available and we can speak about it, we'll make sure and, and, uh, and communicate those things to you. So it's important to be able to do that. And the thing that's really interesting here is that people in general are very forgiving, especially if a company has a good reputation, if they've got what we call reputational equity, They've built up their reputation, they've done the right things over a long period of time, um, and then there's a screw up. People in our country, I don't know if it's everywhere, but they, they have a tendency to want to believe the best of people. And uh, if a company handles a crisis well, um, which is you know genuine, genuine apologies, taking responsibility, not blaming others, not looking for a scapegoat, being honest, doing the right things uh, in terms of addressing the issue, whatever it might be, if it's an oil spill, you know, our first concern are, you know, is the community. Our first concern are the people that might be affected, getting them safely away from that oil spill. And we immediately, you know, we have teams coming in to clean, you know, just that sense of urgency and caring about the same thing we care about, right? First, you know, people, are they okay? Are they safe? You know, our kids safe, our babies safe, you know, uh, you know, our pets safe. You know, keeping their priorities in, in, uh, in the way that they handle a crisis in a way that we're, you know, aligns with what we think uh, is appropriate. And I think that we're, you know, usually on about the same page with that kind of thing. Um, and here's just some quick facts for you, and I, I think that this really uh, helps to sum up the importance of corporate reputation. Uh, about 63% of a corporation's value is attributable, attributable to its reputation. So uh, this is, I think, largely associated with corporations that are traded on the stock exchange. But nonetheless, I mean, it just goes to show you how important reputation is to the value of the company and how well it will, will perform over time. Uh, on average, companies with good reputations outperform the S&P 500 by 6%, and it takes almost four years for a failed company to regain its public stature. And by failed, what we're talking about is a, a reputation failure, 
like for example Susan B. Cohen here recently. Um, it also takes seven consecutive positive quarters for a company to reasonably state that its, its reputation is back on the mend. And uh, you know, that just means that once you get started in, in repairing your reputation, that you don't, you know, you can't have any other uh, problems along the way. Because the thing about reputation is that once you have sort of a crack in your reputation, then the first time something goes wrong, everybody remembers that crack, right? It could be years ago. But it just, you know, people have a long memory. They're willing to forgive, but they do have a long memory, right? So it's, uh, you know, they, um, they don't expect you to mess up uh, again. So you've got to make sure that you've got your processes in place, you've got your people on board, you've got your values in the right place, you're talking to your stakeholders, you understand what's important to them, and that has to be the most important to you, uh, thing to your company as well. All right? All right, yes. I was going to say, BP, there was a long history of failure to comply with safety regulations. Yes, there was. Area. Yes, there was. And it was their former uh, chief in London who was the source of it. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's, I, I think that's really important. And that, that same situation came out with News Corp, right? Oh, yes. Long history of all this nonsense, but it just hadn't bumped to the surface in any kind of significant way. And of course, in the case of BP, it was uh, tragic. Yeah. Really tragic consequences. How do you do? Uh, in the political arena, um, I think we've seen some real um, bloopers. And yet, um, it's not uncommon for those to recover as quickly as six months. So, uh, how do you rate, measure uh, the degree of problem uh, that uh, that is the risk um, of uh, reputation damage that's going to be as long as you were showing in your, your yeah. metrics? Yeah. Well, you know, uh, politics, that's certainly sort of its own animal, right? And uh, in the midst of a campaign season, uh, people are remarkably swayed by advertising. So today, I don't like somebody, but then I see the negative ad, and I'm like, whoa, well, maybe, you know, maybe I should go this direction or that. So, um, and, and uh, in a presidential election, or even, you know, even your mayor, you know, your mayoral election, there is a crowd of people that are just like, you know, my vote doesn't matter, they're not going to engage. There's a crowd of people who care very deeply about what happens, and those are the people that are most involved, getting the vote out, that sort of thing. And then there's a group of people in the middle that are very, um, I guess we call them, uh, right, the independents, which is, you know, the independents, right, are deciding our elections these days. So, um, you know, you've got to uh, just understand that in the political arena, in the political arena, it's, uh, it's different than the corporation in that the, uh, the personal connection with who you, who's going to lead you and what is that going to mean to policy and what's that going to mean to my Medicare or, you know, their, the, the emotional attachment or the emotional fallout, if you will, in the political season, you know, that the stakes are much higher. The stakes are much higher. Uh, and you, what you also see in America is also this willingness and sort of a hopefulness that you can find the person who, um, who will best represent your interests. All the while, sort of mistrust, mis, mistrusting everybody, right, on some level. So, yeah, the political dynamic is very, uh, very unique. But you know, who was it? Who's the New York guy? The it was the AG. Yeah, the AG. Yeah, isn't he like got a television show now, right? Well, he does. He does. It's it's incredible. incredible. I know. So. Next to the American company. <laughs> 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 you, know, you gotta ask yourself, how does that guy fall well, that far from grace and end up getting a job on? No, we do. Yeah. So is there a standard list of um, strategies for a company? Well, that's a really good uh, question because what we see is it's not a thing. It's not a simple strategy. It's really a culture. And that culture, let's just say that you've got a culture of compliance and a culture of uh, you know, being a good corporate citizen in your community. And so that impacts things like how you invest your profits, right? So 
uh, for example, if community matters to you, then you're investing back in your community through corporate social responsibility initiatives. So, you know, you're supporting your local United Way, for example, or you're matching employee funds, or you're adding jobs locally, or you're providing training and mentoring. So, yeah, I mean, absolutely, depending on what that vision, mission, and those core values are, then how you behave as an organization and how you invest needs to be aligned with those values. So the, so the strategy could certainly vary company, uh, company to company depending on uh, how they weight those values and how they uh, spend limited resources, right? Any more questions? We have a couple minutes. And microphone, you have one. <coughs> Well, I'll just point out that uh, BP just announced like a $7 billion profit, <laughs> up 38% from a year ago. So I think they've recovered. Despite <laughs> well, I don't know if we all think that BP is a great company, but um, you know, they're doing well. Yeah. Well, I think that's probably the most important thing that we need to do successful in their business, but one thing that's pretty common is they hate selling. Right? They hate putting on the sales hat and going out and getting business, or or maybe they've gotten accustomed to doing it the way they're doing it, but they just don't have a system for doing it more productively, more efficiently. So Mike Wynn with Sandra Train. Hello. I asked if there was going to be any problems with the camera, but I think I made a really big face in this camera. Um, I'm Liz Cezat with Cezat Creative Resources. I'm a writer and marketing consultant, and right now, if anyone's um, doing websites and they need a writer, I'd be happy to talk with you. I'm Roger Rail, uh, information consultant. I do a lot of videoing for meetup groups, and uh, I'm going to actually be at Detroit New Tech tonight, uh, where... Uh, We'll be streaming live, and so it can't be there in person. It's going to be at one of Copyware's new buildings downtown. Also, um, with the help of Jim and uh, Dennis and 
Mike Morris, uh, we did some video of the ACE 12 conference uh, a week ago. And those uh, videos are going to be rolling out over the near future, so you can keep your eye out. If you weren't able to attend ACE, you'll be able to look at the videos. Hi, I'm Dennis Skupinski. I'm in sales and marketing. I also help Roger out doing some videotaping. I'm in transition, and I'm a recent Shifting Gears graduate. Hello, my name is Krishna, and uh, I come from Magenta Systems. We make websites and we do IT staffing. And uh, we do websites for lack of our clients. So probably sometimes they ask for writers to do that. So probably we should talk. And um, for major organizations, Magenta provides IT staffing for a smaller to medium range. We do web applications for smaller startups. We do websites for them. That's what I do. Thank you. Hi, my name is Brad Fritz. I'm a recent graduate at risk. Okay. Yes, I know it sounds like Brad did. Um, I'm a recent graduate at the University of Michigan, and now I'm an online marketing uh, intern at Stone Interactive Group, which is a small SEO firm here in Ann Arbor. Hello all, my name is Chris Poza. I'm a recent graduate of the one and only MSU. I'm uh, currently right now kind of looking at a bunch of different opportunities and trying to figure out what it is exactly I want to go into. I'm Bud Gibson. I'm a professor at the one and only EMU. I started the search marketing program there. Uh, our uh, students, uh, we have a sequence of courses. Uh, students look uh, all the way from inbound marketing, uh, getting visitors to your site, converting those visitors to customers, which is obviously what you want. Um, I have a couple of great students right here, um, Gail and Carrie, and I'll let them introduce themselves. Hi, uh, my name is Gail Baird. I'm a recent GMU graduate and a former student with Bob Gibson, uh, specializing in search engine marketing. Um, I currently manage the accounting and bookkeeping functions for two small businesses, and I'm here to network and look for employment. <coughs> I'm a search marketing professional. I'm working three part-time jobs right now until I find my uh, new full-time search marketing adventure. Thank you. Hello, everybody. Carol Cam with Encore Online Resale. Um, our customers use us to turn those idle things that are sitting around at home in the closet or in the storage room of the business into cash. Hi, Kathy Griswold. I'm chair of communications for the local Kiwanis Club and Kiwanis Foundation. And we're just launching a new project to try to use print media, which is always more expensive than online media, but to use the print media to drive more traffic to our online media. So I'm, I'm looking for any advice. Hi, my name is Dale Lewin. I'm a recent graduate from Michigan State University as well, and currently I intern for Derek as digital marketing intern at Gamex Digital Marketing. My name is Greg Boyle. I work with Bloom Roofing Systems, and we provide commercial roof replacement and roof repair services. And I'm just here trying to learn how to manage uh, our image and media. Hello, Laura Spencer, I'm a Serco Canton and Serco Washington County. We're a 24-hour fire and water remediation specialist. I help commercial businesses get an emergency ready plan together so that they aren't one of the 50% that close when an event happens at their facility, like we've never even heard of them. <coughs> good afternoon, everybody. I'm Dave Murray, the big guy at Good Stuff Studios, and I hate Eli Manning. <laughs> so, Every week I come in here and I say something ridiculous like that, though that was true. Um, and I tell you guys that we do bold graphics and all this, and I thought I'd come in with an example this time. Not that I have it on me, but if anybody's seen our stuff online, you may have seen a monkey ad. This ad was for an auto parts company that sells pistons, gaskets, uh, bearings, just stuff like that. And they came to us and said, we need something different than what everybody else has. So we look through, and we're going, Cam Chef, Cam Chef, Cam Chef, I'm bored looking through this. Let's go with monkeys. <laughs> and it went nuts, and it's got people paying attention. So that's it. Thank you, Dave Murray, from Good Stuff Studios. My name is Larry Polka. First time I'm here. Uh, 
I'm right now doing some consulting and marketing, business development, strategic planning, market research, and really looking for a full-time opportunity. My name is Gary Yost. I'm semi-retired. I spent my entire career in B2B and B2C sales and marketing, and as well as uh, working for media giant Molasses uh, up in Lavonia, Michigan. So at this point in my career, I do some marketing consulting, but I'm also interested in giving back to the industry. And to that end, hopefully everyone will join me next week as I, uh, I'll share some of my experiences in 30 years of marketing and sales with incentives and how you can use in this area of customers becoming much more incentive driven, how you can use incentives to drive business results. Good to see you next week. Hi, my name is Joel Bergen. I'm with Fish Fish. Our motto is catch a deal, help a cause. We help community organizations raise funds and send customers to local businesses with a $1 off universal fundraising coupons it's called Fish Fish Dollars. More information at fishfish.com. I like it. <laughs> I'm uh, Cameron Francis. I'm, uh, my background's in architecture, but I'm uh, doing work in graphic design and uh, web work. Hi, I'm Tom Crawford, and I run a company called Viz Network, and we have an event coming up uh, in conjunction with Open Schools on March 17th, yes, St. Patrick's Day. It's, uh, it's a visual thinking and visual literacy workshop. It's only $100. You can check it out at vizliteracy.com. You can come learn how to do great presentations, web design, print design, mobile, uh, basically any visual communications that you might want to do. <coughs> <laughs> I'm Dr. Thomas Blackwell, principal owner of Intel. That's a train and development company. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Jennifer Ashman, and dare I say, I am a part-time instructor at the University of Michigan. <laughs> and in our, um, uh, I'll also uh, claim to be to Ford. I spent time working with them in New York. And um, yes, I have, a, I have a bias to that domestic. <laughs> Hi, I'm Stacy from Dollar Bill, a local digital print shop. And I'm sorry I'm going to miss that next week, but I'm going on vacation. So, um, Roger, make sure you tape it. Um, we're your local digital print shop, postcards, all that kind of fun things. We're fast and uh, local. Hello, I'm Lance Smith. I'm with uh, Rapidware. Uh, Rapidware Inc. Like software, only fast. Uh, we help companies put the web in their business plan. Uh, typical customers come to us because they're frustrated, because they know there's this wonderful tool out there, the internet, but they're not able to, to leverage that <coughs> internally and externally uh, to serve their needs best. So we help them either find the software they need or write the software they need or a combination thereof to achieve the goals that they're really after. Right. Hello again, I'm Jody Brown and I am a professional interior designer specializing in commercial interior design for offices and healthcare. Um, I am also an adjunct instructor, <laughs> pronounce it, but I'm an adjunct instructor at the one and only EMU. <laughs> and I would love to be with uh, uh, the other instructor because we are going to be going into marketing in our next um, section subject to professional practice for interior design. Hello, I'm Freddie Rosenthal. I own a local insurance agency in Ann Arbor with a team of advisors. I help people that are frustrated when they have a claim and find out that they don't have the right coverages in place. I'm always happy to give you a second opinion on your insurance if you need it. Hello, I'm Bob Shannon. I have a small CPA firm specializing in helping small businesses with their accounting, tax, and business planning. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm J.T. Peterson. I do software business strategy consulting. Where I seem to be getting most of my interest right now is in introducing web-based services, software as a service, into companies that are currently conventional shrink wrap box products. So how do you take your standard product, move it into the web? It impacts everything from your vendor channel, your cost of goods, to how you do service delivery and how you do your pricing models. 
If you need help, give me a call. Hi, I'm Mary Lou Olds. I actually do quite a variety of things. Um, one thing is I'm a freelance writer, including web content. Um, I also um, work with restaurants and marketing for AnnArbor.com. And uh, I'm a licensed life and health insurance agent. So if you have any questions in, on those topics, and I know that can be kind of complicated, mm -hmm. I'd be more than happy to help you out. Thanks. Hi, I'm Morgan Marshall. I'm from Spring Arbor University. I help out with the online lead generation mostly in Facebook and Google Ads. Hi, I'm Rachel Packham. I'm from Spring Arbor University. I'm the director of lead generation there, and I manage the digital marketing campaign for the university. Hi, I'm Karen Hesselberg, and we help local merchants and local businesses get online. Thanks, Carter. Carter volunteers helping us out. Mm -hmm. Thanks a lot. And uh, my name is Derek Marabon, CEO of Ingenix Digital Marketing. And I guess companies usually come to us when they really want to increase uh, traffic to their website, when they want to get more leads and qualified customers in through the digital space. And um, I, want to say, I wanted to thank our sponsor, Lindsay, who's not here today, Metal Cut. Uh, Lindsay is it's in our newsletter. Check the newsletter, but she's holding a kind of a build your website. WordPress seminar in April. So Lindsay is the sponsor this month. And uh, anyone can sponsor this LA2 it's $200 a month. Uh, the newsletter goes out to 1,700 people. So Lindsay grabbed that spot. We always like to promote our sponsors. Yes. Dick, what is that? The, web, the web, WordPress where is it? website it didn't indicate where it was being held. Okay, it's, uh, there's a website. I think it's going to be at Webber. What? Oh. So it will okay. be in Ann Arbor. Okay. Yeah. And now Dee Davies is going to finish this. Hi, I'm Dee Baby, Creative Ideas Marketing. I help business-to-business -business companies improve their revenues, and I've been doing that for over 25 years. Companies come to me when they're concerned because they know they need to do something different to grow their business, but they're not quite sure what to do. Dee Baby, Creative Ideas Marketing. I'm also the voice of Lunch and Arbor Marketing, and it's my pleasure to introduce our um, next week's speaker, who you previously heard in the round of introductions, Gary Yost, is going to be talking about using incentives and coupons to focus your customer's attention on purchasing from you. So a great topic for businesses, Gary Yost next week at Lunch and Outer Marketing. Finally, before we close out the meeting, I am thirdly a purchaser of Eric's book, and I would like to ask Derek to do a public signing for me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I will have some books in the back. Um, Derek will be doing signings in the back. Um, the last time he'll be bringing books here um, for a couple of weeks. Um, he will be speaking um, elsewhere in the Ann Arbor community. We have great respect for Derek. Um, he is the founder of Lunch Ann Arbor Marketing has been keeping us going for nearly four years now. So um, Derek, thank you so much for the signing, and we'll see you next week at 